I went to South America between my junior and senior year in college. I was a music history major at Boston University. That meant European music, of course. And while I was in Peru at Cusco, looking over the precipice of an Andean mountain, flute music came up from the valley below. I could not see the person playing it, but the music was totally unlike anything I had ever heard before. And I suddenly realized, oh my God, I never thought about music anywhere except my own context. And I felt that's not right. Education should include at least mention, <laughs> or I should have thought of it. And I thought, I, I have to try to do something about this. And that introduced me to what I discovered was ethnomusicology. I was attracted to ethnomusicology because of the opportunity to study non-Western mu non music. Um, I grew up in Orlando, Florida and studied classical piano from age five all the way through um, undergraduate college. I was a piano major. And uh, at the same time, I engaged with my own uh, tradition of African-American music. I, as, an, as a um, high school student, actually junior high student, I performed in a, a vocal group, female vocal group, uh, of singing songs of the 1960s, including the Shirelles, uh, Motown artists. And, uh, and once I uh, um, en enrolled in undergraduate college, I formed and led a popular music band called Peaches and Cream with horns and uh, four singers and um, uh, a rhythm section. And in graduate school, I formed another band called Portion of Soul Syndicate. And we specialized pretty much in R&B soul music. So my, my musical interest, while I was engaged with classical piano as a piano major, I was also participating in the African-American popular tradition. And I wanted to continue that um, study. I mean, I wanted to continue it, my involvement, but move it to a more formal level of study. Um, so, and, and also, my, I had an older brother who was in the military in Japan, and he sent me recordings of Japanese music, uh, the show instrument I remember, and the koto, and I was really fascinated by those different sounds. And that led to my interest in just broader uh, musical traditions that I wanted to study. I did not know of the field of ethnomusicology at that time, uh, but my interest in, non, in Western and non-Western musics uh, always existed. I come from Ghana, and um, as you can imagine, uh, post-colonial Ghana. And for us, um, once ethnomusicology opened the way uh, to the study of music from other cultures, uh, most people from post-colonial Africa, um, we, 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 well, let me say, I myself, I came to ethnomusicology by choice uh, because that will allow me uh, to bring uh, the music uh, or musical practices and everything that's associated with it from my village, from that part of the world, to the central pool of um, world academic discourse about music. And so for me, um, that was the main reason why I enrolled in ethnomusicology. Of course, that was even when I came to the United States uh, that I realized, because after my master's, um, I had my master's in Western music theory, and after that, I asked them. I said, "What is it that I can study so that I can bring the music? Because everything that I've studied so far doesn't talk about the music from my village, and I'm from a village. So they said, then you have to study ethnomusicology, and then that's that's how I did and I pursued it and all that." Uh, 
That's an interesting question because when I decided to go back to school after working at a uh, small liberal arts college in Atlanta, I was a voice major. I had been a got my undergraduate at the University of Cincinnati in applied voice, and also um, a master's in vocal studies at Southern Methodist University in Dallas with a, a second degree, a second master's in conducting for sacred music. So I decided and was entered and was accepted and entered at Florida State University as a DMA uh, student in voice, in applied voice, and decided that Hmm, I think I want to do something a little different to at least add on to the knowledge base that I already had in that area. So I said, do I want a third degree in the same exact thing or would I like at least be interested in taking some additional courses? So I decided, why not take the Introduction to Ethnomusicology course? I signed, I enrolled in that, and I also was in the Caribbean Steel Band and in the African Drumming Ensemble because I knew I wanted to had an interest in African-derived musics uh, in the New World or in general in African and African-derived music. So I took those two courses and found that this, wow, this is something, literally a new world was, <laughs> was brought to me and opened up for me. And we had a number of ensembles there. That was under Adele Olson, who is now retired, was the director of the ethnomusicology program there. And then shortly, within a year or two, Michael Bakken came on board. And so, as a result of that, I participated in those two events, uh, Ghanaian Drumming Ensemble, led by Ama Aduanam, who is a member of SEM, and also with the, um, the uh, Steel Pan group. And I was there for four or five years through us or so uh, in both ensembles. I got a chance to perform a little bit on one occasion with the Brazilian ensemble as well. Mm -hmm. And so as a result of those experiences, I knew that I had found another area that was really a place of interest for me. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting making the, the, the shift cognitively, so to speak, from a performance discipline uh, to one that was research oriented, but that still allowed for performance. And that's what I liked about it. And uh, I enjoyed working there as a TA and uh, as a, well, with an assistantship and teaching some of the intro to ethnomusicology, intro to world music classes with the general students at the university. So that's how I got interested. Well, it's kind of a roundabout way. I, um I'd started in graduate. I was interested in American music, and I hadn't. There was no ethnomusicology program in my um, undergraduate uh, institution. And when I got to Michigan, actually, I um, I continued to study music, but I discovered an ethnomusicology program. And so while I didn't go per se in the ethnomusicology program, the type of approach and methodology, methodology and um, exploration was really in tune with my own my own research. You know, I ended up as I was building my career doing a lot of community-based research. Um, very interested in context and social and cultural context. Um, I'm also kind of a historian by trade, but really interested in the people's stories and really using that to explore music and its meaning in life. Well, at Michigan, I discovered a museum practice program which was really uh, the route that I decided to take because I was very interested in working with the public and, and using my research skills and everything to craft narratives and things that I was really in tune with um, making knowledge accessible to everybody. So from there I, um, I had a museum degree and I started working in museums and doing the kind of field work and, and really using music in that um, in that environment, collecting objects, working with donors, uh, doing research. And then I, um, <clears throat> excuse me, later ended up uh, getting a degree in performance studies, which was another lens into really to do my work and frame it. I, in Brooklyn, when I was at the Brooklyn Historical Society, I did a project on the West Indian Carnival, a documentation project, an oral history project, and looking at the neighborhoods in Crown Heights, Brooklyn, and really getting a feel for the communities and the diverse Caribbean, not looking at it just one, one lens, one view. Um, I've done a lot of, <clears throat> it's kind of a roundabout way, and I use my skills marrying music and history. So I, I worked with um, 
Chinese community in Brooklyn. I've also worked in a community. We were looking at AIDS in Brooklyn and working with those communities and telling different stories. I think my biggest project is I'm at the National Museum of African American History and Culture now at the Smithsonian. And that was a big exploration to build a collection and do research and build an exhibition on African American music. And that's taken me far and wide, um, you know, the particular part of my work that I really like going out. And I call it, this is a different kind of field um, in working with donors, finding new stories, new narratives, collecting new objects, and, and interpreting music from a, a different lens there. I was a uh, singer, all my life I've wanted to be a singer, since I was two years old. And um, I was doing a doctorate in voice and was having some difficulty managing some stage fright, 20 years of stage fright. And uh, uh, long story short, decided, uh, I had a professor at the University of Michigan, the dean, who was also a voice professor, um, so that you should take Judith Becker's um, intro to ethnomusicology. And I, he said, I think you would like it. I think it would be something that would interest you. And so um, I didn't think much about it. I didn't even think about why he was asking me. But when I took the course with Judith Becker, I was like, oh my god, this is what I've been looking for my whole life. I had, I had been noticing things in my doctoral program in voice. I was a doctoral student in voice at Michigan. Um, that they would teach black music um, without movement or without, without dance. And for me, that didn't make any sense. And then I noticed that most of the people who taught those courses were not people of African descent, and that didn't make any sense to me. And um, I had said kind of in my, in my inside voice <laughs> that I would like to see uh, black music taught differently so that people, I even thought Johann Strauss would be better if um, college students learned how to waltz and that maybe that would um, deter some of the sexual assault uh, things that were going on on college campuses even 20 plus years ago. I just thought there's no um, enculturation, no training in civility with the opposite sex and so once I took that course and once I began to learn about transcription and analysis and um, I liked the people and I liked studying people as opposed to studying notes on a page. And so that's what attracted me to ethnomusicology. I ended up at University of Michigan uh, and I just recently learned this from another graduate of the School of Music, um, Professor Edith Boroff who taught at SUNY Binghamton. Um, she was my, um, a, a professor of mine in music history at, uh, during my master's program. And uh, she recommended that I attend, uh, that I pay attention to the University of Michigan. Um, she had a really interesting approach to teaching music history, the course, the semester I took it. She played 19th century composers on a listening exam at the beginning of every class and then later revealed at the end of the semester when she, she would always warn us, don't guess who the composer is. Uh, if you guess who the composer is, you'll lose like 25 to 50 points on each. So it, it was prohibitive, you, you would not try to guess. And at the end of the semester, she shared that all of the composers, this was a white woman, okay, let me be clear. All of the composers were African-Americans from the 19th century. And I hadn't known any black composers from the 20th century at the time. And that was really um, a great pedagogical um, like lever, like it opened something up for me. And then so when she recommended that I look at Michigan, she also mentioned that they had had a black music symposium in 1985 and uh, that a lot of black composers were there and professors and that she and uh, some people may know Richard Crawford, a scholar who's an expert in Duke Ellington and Porgy and Bess were the only two white people there and that intrigued me as well. And so I ended up auditioning, going there for a doctorate in voice. Um, and um, Michigan had seven African-American faculty in music, theater, and dance, um, and about 30 African-American and, and not many African students then, but all African-American students. 
And uh, we had all come from feeder programs around the country, some HBCUs, historically black colleges, and some predominantly white colleges and universities, that we were usually the only black student in our class or in the school. And so now there's 30 of us on the undergrad and grad level. Um, it was a really life-changing experience for me in music to be with classically trained black musicians at one of the premier institutions for schools of music in the country. It was, um, and so um, all of the people, we just had a uh, kind of a reunion of that 1985 Black Music Symposium called Reflecting the Past, Looking Toward the Future. And uh, there's so many black classical musicians and composers that come out of the University of Michigan. So I'm a very, I'm a proud, go blue, Michigan alum <laughs> and the program there, uh, the ethnomusicology program there has been really, has produced some of the most visionary ethnomusicologists in my opinion. I think we're all great at what we do, but I think um, Deborah Wong, Ronald Rodano, um, uh, just I could, I could list on both hands the number of people who've come out of the ethnomusicology program at Michigan, and they all do very innovative work. Timothy Taylor uh, was, even though he was historical, he studied a lot of ethnomusicology. There it was a, it's just a, it was a great experience, uh, coming of age for me there as an adult, and as a an emerging. Scholar. I went to UCLA, and it had everything to do with my career, because it was the early days of ethno. I finished my thesis in. Um, and my degree in 1971, and in those days there were very few graduate programs in ethnomusicology, and the one at UCLA had the most ambitious director, um, Mandel Hood, who was intent on introducing other kinds of music into curricula and music departments everywhere. He really had a goal. And he set about doing that quite systematically. That was what he was like. And he would, he, he used the ploy of having the gamelan play at the American Musicological Society meeting so that people could see this court tradition and understand that this was very interesting music and it didn't sound very threatening, you know. And <laughs> And gradually, there was student pressure in many places to diversify the musical curriculum. And the directors of those places would just call Mental Hood and say, who do you have that you might send us? This was before affirmative action hiring. And he literally just placed his students, Bob Brown at Wesleyan, Robert Garfius at Seattle, William Mom at Michigan, Fred Lieberman at Brown. I mean, he literally, Lois Anderson at Wisconsin. I, the, I could keep going with this. And those became programs with graduate studies. And there it went from there. So my having been a student there in that era had everything to do with my career. I was not hired uh, during the affirmative action period. It wasn't, it was in the air but not a law when I was hired at Brown University as a result of Fred Lieberman, my colleague uh, from UCLA, who simply told the chair, you know, we're going to do this. I never had an interview. The faculty didn't know I had been hired when I got there. It was a little awkward, but um, that's the way it was in those days. And so the highlight has been that I was able to join the TED community. I'm a Ford Fellow as well. And to be among people who are really out to change um, the inequality and the inequities that we have in society. Um, my particular orientation is towards gender and racialized gender um, from YouTube to Wikipedia right now. Um, I think that it's uh, more critical than it's ever been for people to think about the role of the arts and the role of music in healing the kind of rifts that we have in society and in the world and that um, you can't argue uh, a love song away. You can't, 
it's a different part of your brain and it's a different part of uh, intellect when you write about how music affects people's lives and how um, people use the most heinous, hurtful, harmful things and turn them into extraordinary pieces of human you know, communication, which we call music, art, dance, movement. Um, and that I think in this age of moving towards math and science all the time, that we forget how important it is to humanize our souls with art and music and dance and poetry and song and and uh, tune speech and and play and play and play that's like the big thing about it. and play so it's important that there are alternative uh, alternative curricula um, in academia and in, in a world where people are increasingly anxious about what they need to do with their degrees, that there's a space where people can slow down and think about what it means to be human. Not just part of the humanities, but to enact uh, ethnomusicology for many of us is part being a performer and part being like a creative nonfiction writer. And um, uh, all of us uh, from the poorest of the poor to the wealthiest of the wealthy think about things. But to craft narratives where people see themselves in those narratives, um, whether it's through um, ethnographic performative pieces or writing, um, I think it's something that English can't provide as easily as someone who studies ethnography and turns turns experience into some kind of translated text. Um, so this this thing about being getting a degree of higher education and learning to meet other people, learning to translate their experiences, I think that's incredible. You can find it in a lot of the social sciences, but ethnomusicology provides a very unique orientation to that. Um, and I think the other is that there's for, for me, being African American and uh, trying to sell this all the time as well, but I, I realized if I love music, I get to do something I love and um, have it valued in a way that becoming just a musical artist isn't. Um, the work that I produce has an impact on my, in my community, not just ivory tower, I go somewhere and I leave my community, and all that I write about has nothing to do with the people that I came from. Um, uh, I, I am a native ethnographer, I write for other African Americans, I write so that people around the world can appreciate what African American experience and culture is, and um, probably even the latter part of this is like, I, I happen to teach at a school that has a lot of students of African descent, um, my classes are full of students of African descent and um, we don't have enough spaces in predominantly white institutions that are predominantly non-white so that white students can also learn what it's like to not to decenter the things that we've inherited that are predominantly Western oriented. Um, even pop music can be Western oriented in the way that people think about things where the bottom line is more important than um, who, whose memory music came from. And so there's a very, it's, it's, I increasingly learned how important and political it is to do this kind of work, but to still keep the fun and the play and the and the joy and the flourishing essence that comes from being in music and in performance and then all of the things that performance alludes to about what's political in life. We all perform identities, all of us. It doesn't matter who you are and when you think about it through the lens of music making it can kind of help you understand why, I don't know, whiteness looks different than Asianness or South Asianness looks different than East Asianness, um, but that they're all things that um, I think all of us um, we don't just learn them. They're they're 
the spaces we occupy, the region, the dirt, the soil, they, they keep in place certain identities. And these, these social science disciplines help us see the humanizing factors in that.